The gorge that the Van Staden's river had carved for itself down to sea level was an act of nature taking millions of years. But now the Aventure Railway had to find a way of dropping a similar height from the summit beyond the bridge to sea level at the Hamtour's river. That way came to be known as Tippett's Luck. The name describes the section of line between Summit and Luri in the lap of the Hamtour's valley. It was so called because engineer Arthur May Tippett refused to accept the surveyor's view that there was no economically viable route down into the valley. Mr. Tippett had an intuitive feel for the narrow gauge. He allowed the railway to nose out its own route and follow the lie of the land, bending itself to the laws of topography. In fact, the routes determined by surveys often gave way to very different actual routes found empirically during construction. Farmers in the area, delighted that their railway was taking shape, gladly handed over the extra land that was often needed, and the section to Lurie was successfully completed, taking the line to kilometre 71. The Hamtours River presents an aspect very different to Van Staden's. Wide and sluggish, it meanders languidly across the vast alluvial plain that intermittent floods have created for it. A century ago, long before one of its major tributaries was dammed, it was a much bigger river than it is today. The indigenous Khoikhoi people named it Khamtuas, the path of the lion. The first bridge across the Khamtuas was essentially a temporary structure and was partially washed away by floods during its construction in 1904, and again even more dramatically the following year. So in 1909, work began on replacing the original timber trestle with a much sturdier bridge, built well clear of the flood line. The Sauer Bridge was finally opened by J.W. Sauer, Minister for Railways and Harbours, in October 1911, in the nick of time before the flood season of that year. In the interests of cost saving, this bridge came into being as an interesting hybrid. It consists of six separate approach spans and one central span. The approach spans, both north and south, were constructed from an assortment of existing bridge material. With its rather doubtful aesthetics, the bridge as a whole betrays its mixed origins. Only the central arch was specially designed and built for the Aventure line. Like all the bridges on the line, the Sauer Bridge was built with the capacity for possible future conversion to the standard gauge. The Longkloof, as its name suggests, is a long, narrow valley running east-west between the Koha and Tsitsikama mountains. Extending for about 120 kilometers parallel to the southern Cape coast, it's the fruit basket of South Africa. Apples are among the most important of its crops. The route through the Longkloof represented the bulk of the distance covered by the Aventure line, but by the time it reached this area, the worst of the engineering challenges had been overcome, and the cost per mile here was correspondingly lower. As the tracks penetrated ever deeper into the region, kilometres were ticked off and station names added to what was steadily becoming a long and viable railway. On December the 10th, 1906, the tracks finally reached Aventure, and the completed line was officially opened early in 1907. The philosophy of the visionaries who pioneered the Aventure line was that it was put in place to develop a primitive area from scratch, rather than to merely link existing markets together. The Railway Administration even initiated an education program for local farmers, giving advice on everything from the most profitable crops to grow to the most suitable implements to cultivate them with. 
Indeed, the coming of this pioneer railway provided much more than just a means of transportation. It brought wealth and prosperity to a previously undeveloped region. With this crucial addition to their lives, farmers in the once remote Longfleur could now get their produce safely and quickly to both local and overseas markets. With a total of 284 route kilometres between Humewood Road and Avontier, this was an ambitious railway. And the success that it brought to the Longfleur farmers was not lost upon other farming communities in the district. Shrouded in early morning mist, the Humtuas River makes its leisurely way to the sea. The alluvial plain supports fertile, well-watered farmland, its acreage increasing as the valley opens its arms to meet the Indian Ocean at the Humtuas mouth. But at the end of the 19th century, this valley, like the Longfleur, was crying out for development. It needed a railway. A branch line was proposed, leaving the main Port Elizabeth Avontier line at Humtuas Junction. It would turn inland and follow the river, while the main line continued westwards roughly parallel to the coast. Although the route had already been surveyed by 1900, it was more than a decade later before construction actually began. The line was built to hug the sides of the river valley, thus entailing a much higher cost per kilometre in earthworks than any other section of the Avontier system. The railway boasted over a kilometre of culverts and, for a narrow-gauge railway, a great many cuttings and embankments. Nonetheless, this was the route that was chosen to best serve the farmers of the valley. The stimulus of the railway very soon doubled the number of acres under cultivation. All manner of produce came from this warm, bountiful region. Tropical and deciduous fruit, an assortment of vegetables, maize, oats and even timber. Such was the potential that the initial decision to take the rails only as far as Hankey was soon revived, to include a section to Potensi, adding 15 kilometres to the original 13. The rails reached Potensi in the late summer of 1914, at which point the Hanke Potensi branch was officially opened, 15 years after it was first mooted. The Aventure system was now complete.